Thank you for joining us for this sermon podcast from United Christian Church of Austin, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. Our sermon for today, Sunday, August 26th, 2018, is entitled, A Dollar Fifty Cookie and an Open House. Comes to us from our guest preacher, Josh Mata, a member of our congregation and an alum of our youth group. It's a reflection on a reading from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministries at United Christian Church, simply head over to our website, www.uccaustin.org. Thank you. morning. You were all probably hoping to hear John preach today, or Nikki, or Carl, or anyone who has at least graduated from college. I apologize. I was too. But when John Gage, the John Gage, sends you a text asking you to preach on your dad's birthday, how do you say no? So if you need someone to blame, blame the people who put the idea in his head. And I wasn't going to name names, but it's already out there. Megan Trout and Rebecca Molis. That's who you should blame. That's who I blame. Anyway, I have this belief, a belief that each individual on the face of this earth has their own personal faith. Despite the fact that we share the same religion, some of us having the same denominations, same beliefs, I believe that each individual's faith is unique and ever-changing. And this is because of us as individuals changing, living in a world that is changing, having different experiences, and having our own relationships with God. Most of my faith has been influenced by my parents, um, Tim Tutt, Ken White, Mary Lou, Nick, John, and Megan, and a bunch of other people. But my faith is different from all those people. My faith is unique due to the very fact that I've had different experiences. Because faith isn't just some sort of Rubik's Cube that you twist and turn until you get it just right. When I had first written the sermon for Hyde Park Christian Church, it looked completely different. Um, I had a scripture and a big idea or a main lesson that I knew every sermon had to have but I trashed it because it was absolutely terrible. (laughs) It was a lot of recycling lessons that I'd learned from smarter individuals, and it was completely unoriginal. Instead of doing that, I thought I'd just share a few stories, two, in fact, um, stories that have helped shape my faith to what it is today, hoping that maybe you'll hear something new. These stories both occurred over the course of my college career. The first one was during the fall of my sophomore year, 2016, at none other than the University of Texas. Hook them. The YCT group, the Young Conservatives of Texas, decided to host a bake sale. Seems pretty harmless, but this was no ordinary bake sale. While I would pay the price of $1.50 for a cookie, someone else could get the same cookie at no cost at all. How? This particular group decided that they would vary prices based on the buyer's race and gender. So if you were Asian, you'd pay $1.50 for a cookie. White, $1. Black, 50 cents. Hispanic, 50 cents. Native American, free. And if you were female, you'd get a whopping discount of 25 cents off. You see, this group claimed that they were a quote-unquote colorblind organization that believes all government institutions are constitutionally prohibited from discriminating on the basis of race in all circumstances, including affirmative action. 
You see, they were protesting affirmative action, deeming it racist. Because in 2008, a Caucasian woman by the name of Abigail Fisher was denied admission at the University of Texas. Abigail would then file a suit claiming that less qualified minority students had been admitted into the university over her and that UT had discriminated against her on the basis of her race. And a few months before the bake sale took place, the Supreme Court upheld UT's affirmative action system in a very close four to three vote. You see, I passed by that bake sale. I passed by before everyone noticed what they were really doing. I passed by before a couple hundred students protested their protest. I passed by that bake sale before all the hate and anger that that bake sale inspired really came about. I walked towards that bake sale and noticed their signs. As I saw the different prices, I was a bit taken aback. I looked closely at the different prices and rolled my eyes. I was in no mood to argue or to even talk to them and figure out why. They tried to sell me a cookie and I don't know what they were trying to accomplish with that since they'd be basically ripping me off. I don't know what they were trying to accomplish at all. I stood back and watched as more people um, noticed the bake sale, noticed their signs, and were offended at the notion. I must admit that during this whole time I was processing everything that was going on, going on and I was absolutely 100% being judgmental. While their bake sale didn't insult my education, it did insult everything that I believed in. I was in disbelief. I was disappointed, and I was kind of angry, to be honest. People who have never known or experienced racism cried out as if they were victims. Negative thoughts were going through my head, insulting their intelligence and what I believed to be ignorance. I wanted to just walk away, and I probably should have, but that was the biggest thing happening that day, and controversy as a way of getting to me. Anyway, in the midst of arguments and hate and exchanges of unkind words, I noticed a Hispanic female student. And she walked up to one of the YCT students participating in the bake sale and said three words I never expected to come out of her mouth. I forgive you. I forgive you. She walked away and left the YCT student with his mouth hanging slightly open, disengaged and speechless. I don't know if anyone else heard what she said or if that YCT student even took her words to heart since he kept doing his thing at the bake sale a few moments, a few moments later. But in that moment, I couldn't even describe to you how that felt. I was also left in utter disbelief because in response to students who insulted her education and qualifications and place at the university and threatened the very existence of future minority students on that campus, she delivered the biggest mic drop since Obama out <laughs> at the 2016 White House Correspondents' Dinner. I was inspired by this unknown person's grace, her courage, and by the love that it took to respond in that way. Now the second story actually happened this summer. As soon as I finished finals, I traveled to the beautiful country of Morocco with a small group from the Higher Education and Leadership Ministries program. This program seeks to develop leadership, and ab leadership abilities in its members so that they can be leaders in whatever they pursue. And in our third year, we have a focus of global awareness. So we went to Morocco to learn about how Christians live out their faith in a Muslim context and how global ministries and week of compassion engage in ministry to migrants and refugees. See, thousands of, mi thousands of Africans are migrating north from their own countries due to civil war, economic ruin, drought, political persecution, and many other reasons. Thousands of Africans migrate north, and thousands of Africans die on the way there. Some are attacked and arrested by authorities. And when they reach North Africa, they realize that they are not welcome there. 
the government and most of the citizens of these northern African countries want absolutely nothing to do with them. Because of this, they are victims of hunger, homelessness, unemployment, racism, and injustice. They soon realize that there is nothing there for them, and there is nothing for them back at home. And so this trip, as I said, was learning about what Christians in Morocco did to deal with migrant and refugee issues. And most of it was a very positive learning experience, except one. A group called CEI, International Aid Committee in French, was having an open house, is what I think they called it. They were providing medication, used clothes, and counseling. We helped set it up, but our role in that event was to sit down and listen to the stories of these migrants and refugees. We sat there and listened as the interpreter told the stories of how these people got there and what they were struggling with. They all had a similar need of going to Europe in search of a better life because there was nothing there for them. But with the limited resources that CEI had, there was absolutely nothing they could do in that situation. A lot of things went wrong that day, and I won't get into full detail, but the atmosphere in that place soon became toxic. A young group of migrants were distraught and tired of how we weren't really doing anything to help them. The quality of clothes that were provided weren't in the best shape, and at one point they started throwing some of these clothes at the volunteers. They also wanted to start fights and yelled what I assumed to be unkind words to the volunteers. The whole event became disorganized and it was at one point deemed unsafe to continue and the whole thing was shut down. As our group later shared our reflections and reactions to the event, I remember sharing how angry it was. I remember being incredibly upset about how the volunteers were treated and how the migrants had absolutely no right to behave in that way. Then Reverend Chris Dorsey, the president of our organization, shared something with our, with our group. He said that our group, especially since some of us were white, our group represented the imperial structures that they've known and loathed their whole life. There was also an inaccurate perception of us being wealthy and having an abundant amount of resources. And with that viewpoint, I was humbled. Chris also told us that that wasn't the way he wanted that experience to go. But looking back at it, I'm glad that it did. I will never fully understand their situation and what they deal with. I will never fully understand what it means to have no place to go. To travel through Africa on foot and be unwelcomed at your destination. To have no place to call home. To not knowing where your family members are. To be at the hands of injustice no matter where you go. To always being at risk of being beaten, sexually assaulted, or arrested. I'm thankful for having experienced that. It helped me understand their pain, their adversity, the desperate feeling that they have every day. And so in both of the stories that I share today, I was ignorant. In both of these stories, I just stood there doing nothing and being angry. But both of these stories have helped shape my faith to what it is today, because in both of these stories, I learned. I learned a lot about other people's stories. I learned about grace in times where it, when it might be difficult. I learned a lot about my faith and how I was expressing it. I learned a lot about myself and what I can improve on. And as a guy who's just trying to live out his faith the same way that Jesus taught us, that's all I can really do. Amen. Following along Josh's uh, way of thinking, I want to uh, blame the person who started all this, and that is to give thanks to God for the ways that God has been moving in Josh's life and the way that God has used Josh to speak a word to us this morning. During our nine o'clock worship this morning, I was reminded of a hymn. This is often the way my faith journey works, little snippets of things that float through my mind. But, 
pieces being put together in a larger puzzle. It's the hymn that I've actually never had the opportunity to sing with a congregation because it is a hard hymn, not musically, but theologically, a hard hymn for us to hear in our settings. But I was moved to share it, and I'll share it with you. It says, Spirit of Jesus, if I love my neighbor out of my knowledge, leisure, power, or wealth, help me to understand my neighbor's anger, the helplessness that hates my power to help. And if, when I have answered need with kindness, my neighbor rises, wakened from despair, keep me from flinching when the cry for justice requires of me the changes that I fear. If I am hugging safety or possessions, uncurl my spirit as your love prevails to join my neighbors, work for liberation, and find my freedom at the mark of nails. Friends, if you have wor heard the word of God preached here this morning, remember to give all honor and glory to our one God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit.